Hello, this is Alder High Priestess Tehila from the Coven of the Open Mind, and you're watching Intro to Magical Disciplines. This is episode four, and today we're talking about Erismancy. Erismancy is also called erotic magic. Um, it's very widely found in many cultures around the globe. It has a long history from stories of women begetting children with the gods, you know, that uh, is, you know, erismancy in a sense, uh, where, where in the metaphorical sense you could, you could, you know, visualize and, and envision uh, having a sexual experience with the deity and, and then from that having a child in the form of some kind of um, project or inspiration or something like that. So in a metaphorical sense, um, that's something that you could use erismancy for even today. And so it hasn't changed much. The nature of erismancy is the same because the nature of love and sex is largely the same. Um, erismancy is found all throughout the globe. There's no one culture that could say that they founded erismancy. But when you think of like sex or love magic, when you think of the Western take on it, the ritual ver version of it that you can find in like American Horror Story, there's an example where the one character wants to have a baby and she's having trouble conceiving. So she gets rose petals and all these ingredients and she sets everything out and there's a bunch of candles and you know, rose petals strewn on everything. And then there's this weird thing with snakes because it's like a horror movie. So of course it gets weird, but, um, you know, but the idea of that kind of ritual setting with two people coming together having sex and as a result of that experience having some kind of product come out of that, in this case a child, but it could, again, it could be inspiration, it could be money, it could be a blessing, it could be a spell. Um, that is something that really hails from the Renaissance period and the the father of of you know modern air science, he really is Ficino. Um, he was a philosopher and a writer in the 1400s, and he wrote De Amore in 1484, uh, which means on love. And I wanted to read this quote because I think it does a pretty decent job of capturing. Um, what Erismancy means from a high level. It's very fancy and eloquent. And I really like it. So I'm, I hope you do as well. He writes, the whole power of magic is founded on Eros. The way magic works is to bring things together through their inherent similar similarity. The parts of this world, like the limbs or organs of some animal, all depend on Eros which is one. They relate to each other because of their common nature. Similarly, in our body and brain, the lungs, the heart, the liver, and other organs interact, favor each other, intercommunicate, and feel reciprocal pain. From this relationship is born Eros, which is common to them all. From this Eros is born their mutual reproachment, wherein resides true magic. So I like this quote because um, he explains a system of magic that believes that without love, without Eros, there is no magic, <laughs> um, which I think is really cool. You know, the magic of friendship. <laughs> Yay. I love my little pony. But um, beyond that, what he's basically saying is that interconnectivity depending on each other is in the very nature of existence you know animals uh, the limbs and organs of the animals all depend on eros they all depend on each other and because of that dependence they become one being they become one animal and similarly for us with our body and brain uh you know he's basically saying with that line that our sexual selves, the parts of our being that are sexual in nature, are not something to be denied. 
they're a part of us. They are who we are. And that's, that's all there is to it. We would not be who we were without it. And then he goes on to say that Eros is born in mutual reproachment. So when you and another being uh, are able to work together and, and build each other up and share pain and have, you know, true empathy, then you are able to create true magic. So he describes, Ficino describes Eros as a relationship between two people. And he says that Eros manifests naturally. It comes from that interaction, the interaction of two people. And if you get rid of all the bias and all the details and you get everything else out of the way, what you're left with is love. So if you approach another person and you have none of that BS going on in your brain when you meet them, then you'll just love them just because that's the nature of the world, which is really a beautiful way of looking at things. And you can find that a similar way of viewing things comes out of Christianity, right? You know, love thy neighbor as you love thyself, just love, love for the sake of love. So it's not a unique concept. Uh, there are other writers who came along later on. I'm not sure how much later on, um, but one of them, Bruno, he changed the nature of Erismancy in a very significant way, which actually caused it to branch. And that's why there's such a variety in the types of things you can do with Erismancy, because his perspective was based on the fact that Eros is the driving force uh, or the driving power behind uh, intersubjective relationships. Um, in, in his case, he didn't mean like sub-dom individual relationships. I mean, he might have, but what he was mostly referring to was um, a way, describing a way to not enslave, but ensnare the general population to persuade them of a specific viewpoint in what he called erotic manipulation or directed hypnosis. And it's actually kind of the foundation for propaganda, which is kind of cool, but, and also terrible in its own way. But um, Bruno, who first came up with this, only wanted to use it for the good. He wanted to find a way. He said, how can you really change people when the problem they're having is their own psychology? Maybe through love, through uh, finding a way to devise wide-scale approaches that involve love and, and mutual understanding, maybe then we can affect many people at once and affect real change in the world. So it's kind of interesting, and it, it sets us up for the divide between the two kinds of erismancy, the one that involves generating sex energy in order to direct it and use it for some purpose, and the one that involves um, generating any form of love, energy, any form of interconnectivity, any form of ecstasy um, so that you can manipulate another person who is experiencing a similar emotional state to you while you raise that energy. Um, and so the former path is the foundation of the great rite in Wicca. Um, it's found in tantric um, practices, which is um, slightly different because it evolved, you know, in its own way in a different part of the world, but um, but it's a similar idea to that. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of different ways of using um, love magic to bring about some positive change in your life that can even be quite common. So, for instance, you know, psychology talks a lot about the importance of sexual compatibility um, between partners. And the reason for that is because um, when you are able to transcend the experience uh, and really get each other into the mindset where you're not thinking and you're, and you're just doing and you're just um, building each other up and um, then you do something that we call making love, right? We're saying you're generating love energy, okay? And that is very common. And many people will say that there's a difference between making love and having sex. And there's religions in this world who don't believe in having sex. 
because they're scared that it will degrade the power of making love, like Judaism, for instance, uh, Orthodox groups where you don't have sex until you're married. That's why. Because when you are with a partner and you are compatible and you generate that energy with each other perfectly and you transcend the experience of the sex, um, then you can generate love energy that is mostly redirected, you know, without even thinking into the relationship in a positive way bringing you closer together, building your bond so that it's stronger. You can survive more things when you have sexual compatibility with your partner. It's sad, but it's true. I mean, is it sad? I mean, I don't know, but it, it is a true statement. I mean, sex is a universal experience for all beings, all humans, even the ones who would like to deny it. <laughs> we are sexual beings. And the way that manifests for most people um, in everyday life is protection and shield work, you know, that they do inadvertently when they really vibe with their partner in a particular session. <laughs> um, if you're interested about more of the history side of things, uh, I've started to deviate away from that. I wanted to recommend a book. It's called Eros and Magic in the Renaissance by Iona P. Culliano. And it is in, I don't know if it's Italian or Latin, but you have to find a translated version. There's lots of them out there. It's, it's very uh, old academic text, so it can be a little hard to get through. There is not a good one book that just gives you a high level overview of all things Eris Mancy. I have looked and looked and this is the closest thing I could find and it's mostly about the history and some of the chapters aren't even really Eris Mancy at all. It's basically this guy's practices uh, and, and his beliefs about magic and some of them are heavily based in Eris Mancy and the history of Eris Mancy. I didn't read it all the way. <laughs> um, I skimmed it but I also knew a lot of the material already, but um, but there's a lot a lot of information there, and I got all of the quotes and stuff I just read from that book as well, so it's pretty solid piece of work. Um, but generally speaking, so for those of you who are like, okay, how do I do Eris Mancy? What do I do Eris Mancy for? Uh, I've mentioned that um, the Great Rite is technically Eris Mancy. This is an example of generating love, of generating Eros, without the sexual arousal. Like, it is sexual energy, but it's not arousing. You can kiss your husband's phallus in ritual while you're blessing it with oil right before the Great Rite, and nobody gets aroused. <laughs> not you, not your husband, not anybody watching. And uh, most of the time you're clothed. <laughs> um, covens, modern day covens, kind of have this thing about uh, naked rites because they're scared of being labeled as cults just by association. Uh, a cult is a group that doesn't let you leave, okay, for the record. Um, but most groups will let you leave. They'll just say, don't share our secrets with anyone after you've left. I feel like that's more like a non-competing clause than anything cult-like. Um, but still, people are scared of being labeled that way and being seen that way. So they distance themselves from things that are taboo. And Eris Mancy is one of them. They do the great right. They do the, the representation of man and woman coming together, you know, m literally phallus and, uh, and, ch and chalice, you know, coming together and, and, and aggressiveness and reception forming life, right? So... That is what the Great Rite celebrates, the, for, the formation of life from two beings coming together out of love. And uh, that is uh, a rite as old as the dawn of time, you know, two beings coming together for love. Um, the idea to use that in a ritual setting may have come about much later on, but, um, you know, and, and many Wiccans will do the Great Rite for real, but only when no one else is around. They'll do it when it's just them and their partner. <laughs> uh, so in that way, Eris Mancy is common in Wicca. Um, and so when you when you work with a partner, you both want to get each other going, get each other off, 
and you want to orgasm together, that's important. Um, the orgasm is the release of the energy out into the world. So you build it together, you do it in circle, you generate the energy, contain it, and then release it out. Ecstatic states can be used to generate life energy in general. Uh, they can actually even be used to do chaos magic as well because it... Um, is a state of non-thinking. When you're sexually aroused, you're not thinking. So it's big in the Gnostic orders. It's a way of generating energy. Um, you can dance to the point of ecstasy and do all sorts of things. That's also technically arismancy because it involves redirecting ecstasy. But um, most people only think of uh, like masturbating or tantric you know, meditation where you're like rocking or you know some technique that gets you aroused. Um, without having to uh, do anything, you know, whatever technique you use uh, to get aroused, the the arousal is considered a part of arismancy oftentimes um, when you're working in that context. So the context matters. Um, I, you know, if you're doing the great right, like I said, that's not about arousal. That's about generating love. And if you're doing a representation where you put the chalice and you put the athame inside the chalice, then you do experience, you know, eros. You do generate love energy, sexual energy, but it's not arousing because it doesn't, it's not intended to be arousing. Uh, if you're in behind closed doors and you're with your partner and you're generating sexual energy that way and you intend for it to be arousing because you're also trying to get to a state of ecstasy, uh, then in that case, that makes sense. So sexual energy can manifest as ecstasy uh, with or without sexual arousal, right? So those are separate, and you have to think of them as separate when you get into arismancy. Uh, now, so what can you do with arismancy? Um, you can do traditional love spells, okay, like getting someone to fall in love with you. That stems from the Bruno path that we mentioned earlier, where you're trying to control how another person feels. I don't personally do any sort of magic like that, um, so I can't really help you. There are lots of articles on that kind of love magic, so go and do some reading. Um, but if you're trying to do, you know, the other kind where you're generating energy and redirecting it, then if you're by yourself, um, you can imagine um, an encounter with deity and visualize, you know, getting your freak on with deity or whatever. Um, you could um, get yourself going some other way. Uh, it's not going to work to use cheap tricks like porn or <laughs> pictures or what. You have to visualize and experience it um, because you have to be in complete control of the energy. So you can't have that experience where you like watch some freaky porn and then you're just like, oh my God, how could I have ever done that? Now that I have gotten off, I look back and I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> That's a lot of people experience that. Um, I, I don't because I, I exclusively do arismancy. Um, but but what you find is when you do arismancy, you can redirect that energy in other ways. So, um, you know, you, you can get to the point of orgasm or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, it depends on the working that you're doing. Um, but you build that sexual energy so that you can use it in some, in some other working and you can do it with any form of visualization or self-stimulation. Um, you can even use exotic, like erotic, erotic dancing, exotic dancing, you know, hypnosis of some kind. Alcohol helps. Alcohol uh, or any, you know, uh, thing that helps lower inhibitions helps with Um Obviously, there's a sweet spot because you get too much, then it starts to detract from the working. But um, yeah, so it's hard to really go into the specifics of how to do it. I hope this has been a pretty good overview on what it is. Um, it's a very broad topic. Uh, anything that involves love or sex falls into this category, and there are lots of those things in all the different cultures out there. So um, this is, I think, as specific as we're going to get. <laughs> but if you have any more questions, please drop a comment or shoot us an email, covenoftheopenmind at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and we hope you found this helpful. And from all of us here at the Coven of the Open Mind, blessed be.